I want to point this out. A, a good way we can tell what what is good and what is uh, scriptural and, and what are those things that the church is able to come together and say, yeah, we feel really confident about this as the inspired word to God, word of God, is we believe in affirmation through agreement. We believe in unity through unanimity. That is to say that when we're talking about the canon of scripture, uh, one of the kind of bars that we're hoping for scripture to meet is that as the church is meeting together and, and remember you're you're there as part of the first meeting of the church gathering together for the first time uh, there are certain books that maybe you know, I've never heard about that but the books we feel really confident about are the books that we say hey the church is getting together from all around the world for the first time and everyone uses these books Everyone agrees that these are good books to help determine right teachings and right belief for the church. And so when we find that kind of unanimous decision, when we find that kind of agreement in the church, the worldwide church, we find that kind of agreement, we tend to look at those things and say, yeah, that had to be inspired by God to inspire that kind of unanimity among the church. And so when we look at the Protestant Old Testament and we're trying to determine, well, how do we feel about the canonization of this Old Testament? How do we feel about these books that are included here? Um, we could have conversations about the Dead Sea Scrolls and about how they showed how accurate the Old Testament texts are. We could talk about other different historical events. But the big thing that I want to point to is the fact that the Hebrew canon and the, uh, or maybe we'd say the Jewish canon, the Protestant Old Testament, the Catholic Old Testament, the Greek Orthodox Old Testament, we all include those same books which we find in our Protestant Old Testament. And so when you're reading through uh, Judges, we feel really good about the canonization of Judges, that it is meant to be in our scripture, because the whole church all across the world has agreed that that book is part of God's inspired word. Um, so, the Hebrew canon, uh, we'll talk about that briefly. And we talked, we had a whole uh, video, it actually took two videos, where we talked about the canonization, or not the canonization, but the, the books in the Old Testament. All the books we went through, walked through them all, who wrote them, what they wrote about. And so if you weren't here for that, uh, I'd invite you to check out our How We Got Our Bible playlist, and you can get all caught up. Um, so we're going to talk very briefly about these now. But the Hebrew canon, Luke uh, 24, verse 44, breaks the uh, Hebrew canon. It kind of shows us the divisions that existed at the time of Jesus. We're going to break that canon, and these are the divisions they have to this day into the law, the prophets, and the writings. And so the law are those five books that make up the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The prophets are going to be uh, Joshua, Judges, uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and then they also include a number of the prophets, including a, a book where they bound together 12 prophets that we in the, the Protestant uh, tradition, uh, and even in you know Catholic traditions, we divide those prophets up into their own books. Uh, but all that gets included as part of the prophets. Uh, the writings would be poetry and wisdom literature, as we described in that previous study. Uh, they also include Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles, all as part of the writings. Um, and I think for most Jewish believers, they kind of tier these things, where the Pentateuch is the pinnacle of Scripture, and then they have the prophets which support that and the writings which support that. And so... Uh, that's kind of how Hebrew canon shakes out. Um, in 70 AD, year 7D, 70, uh, the temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed. And for Jews up to this point in history, the center of their faith was the temple. The temple was the place you go every year. And so, and you worship God there. And it's where God literally resides with his people. And so in 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. Now this causes 
a crisis of faith for the Jewish people. And so we see the Jewish faith start to transition where the most important part of the faith is no longer worship at the temple, although that's still very important. Um, but what's really important, what we really have that we can put our hands on, is the word of God recorded in his scriptures. And so there's a, a hypothetical council of Jamnia in AD 90, um, where uh, the year 90, where maybe all, all the Jewish leaders get together and agree about the Old Testament canon in the form we have it um, today. Uh, but for the most part, it, it's my belief, but by the time we get to AD 90, the, the canon as we have it in the uh, Protestant Old Testament, it's largely in place for Jewish believers already uh, in that format by the time we get to AD 90. And if, it did, if a meeting did occur in Jamnia in 90 AD, then they're simply affirming that canon, which everyone already recognizes. Um, so that takes us through the Old Testament and why we feel really good about the Old Testament as part of our canon of scripture, part of our measuring stick against which we determine what the right things to believe are. Uh, the, the next part we want to look at is the New Testament and the New Testament canon. And so we talked previously about 325, the Council of Nicaea, as the church gathers together for the first time in order to discuss the Arian controversy. And so they meet for the first time there. At the Council of Nicaea, it's decided that every year there should be a letter to go out to the whole church all around the world to tell them when Easter will be. Uh, because we want to base Easter on, when, you know, the stars and, and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, we're trying to figure out when Easter should be every year. And we want to have agreed time that everyone in the world celebrates the resurrection of Christ. And so there's going to be a letter sent out every year to determine when Easter is going to be. And so uh, a guy named Athanasius takes on the job of writing the Easter letter every year. And in uh, 367, we have the 39th Festal Letter of Athanasius, or the 39th Easter Letter of Athanasius, uh, or sometimes uh, the church, for shorthand, will just call it Athanasius Easter Letter. Uh, but he sends this letter out in the year 367. And so uh, if I can do some quick math, we're talking about 39 years or so after the church meets together for the first time. Athanasius sends out this letter, and this letter is really significant because in it, Athanasius lays out, hey, here are the books that I think we should agree are scripture. And Athanasius lays out a list of books, and in particular, we're looking at the books he lists in the New Testament. And he says, here are the books I think we should include. And these are the books I think we should consider scripture. And there are other books that are maybe helpful, but we do not consider them scripture. And so he lays out these books. And the books he lays out in his New Testament are the same 27 books that are included in our New Testament to this very day. I, again, want to point out that I think what Athanasius is doing there is he's not deciding what books are supposed to be in the New Testament. He's not choosing which books he likes, but he is acknowledging these are the books that from my time uh, leading the church and sending out this Easter letter every year, that I've determined these are the books that are good and helpful that the whole church would agree about. And so he sends out his list of 27 New Testament books that are the very same books that are in our Bible today. It would be another little while before we get to the Council of Carthage in 397, or this is actually the Carthage Synod of 397. And this is where the church meets together and finally affirms and closes the 27-book New Testament. This is finally the point in history where the church, as they're dealing with different pagan influences, that come in from the Catholic, or not Catholic, sorry, Roman uh, world around them um, that is increasingly embracing Christianity, but also increasingly bringing their own thoughts and beliefs into Christianity. 
And they say, well, we want to nail down what our canon is. And so the reason the church hasn't decided before this point is because there was never a reason or a need before this point to say, well, let's nail down which books will be the measure for orthodoxy. But here in 397, the church agrees to nail down what books will be included as part of the canon of scripture. And they list uh, at the Council of Carthage in 397, the 27 books of the New Testament, the same books that Athanasius listed 30 years earlier, and realistically the same books that the church had been using for 200 plus years leading up to that point. What they did at that council when they acknowledged these 27 books as scripture, and I just want to kind of put this out there one more time, one more different way. They didn't choose the books. They didn't decide on the books. They didn't negotiate about what books should be included or not included, but they agreed, they listed, they recognized or remembered those books which God had already revealed to the church all around the world to be scripture. Uh, so, Last thing I want to talk about as we talk about canonization is criteria for inclusion. How do we decide if something should be included or not? Uh, well, the Old Testament is largely accepted because the Jews at the time of Jesus accepted it. And so we accept that as our canon. Uh, but when we look at the New Testament, we have three criteria we're looking for for inclusion in the Bible. The first is that it would be apostolic in origin, meaning this is something written by an apostle or written by someone very close to or next to an apostle kind of relaying their stories for us or to us. And so for the most part, as we look at the books in our New Testament, we see that these are all written directly by people that knew Jesus. There are a couple of things you might call exceptions, and so I want to address those really quickly. But we might look at the writings of someone like Paul, and say, well, he wasn't, he wasn't an original apostle of Jesus. Uh, but we accept Paul's writings for a couple of reasons. We accept really not his writings, but his apostleship for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it's proven and explained in scripture that Paul is an apostle of Jesus, that Paul did have an experience on the road to Damascus with the resurrected Christ, and his life was forever changed, and he kind of becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And we think that's revealed to us uh, through scripture, but also no one in the church questioned Paul's apostleship. There's no one in the world at the time they're saying what books should be included. It's accepted that Paul is an apostle. It's handed down through Christian tradition through the centuries that these writings of Paul, for a lot of churches, they're what we have. They're, they're the writings that preserve the faith for us. And so, of course, we accept Paul's apostleship, and of course, we accept his writings in Scripture. Um, the other exception we might talk about is someone like Luke, uh, where Luke knew and hung out with Paul, and he traveled around, and we presume somewhere along the way he had conversations with other apostles and leaders of the movement early on. And uh and so Luke writes the book of Luke and the book of Acts, and there are historical works where Luke brings these things in. We know that he references uh, works like Matthew or Mark. Um, and so he's, he's really a historian compiling these works and saying this is the story of the early church. But we know by the things that he says in Acts that he's consulted directly with a number of apostles on writing this work. And so, and again, the most important point is that no one in the early church questioned Luke's apostleship, uh, but we accept the apostleship of Luke's writings, um, or the apostolic nature of Luke's writings. And so uh, the last thing I want to point out as we talk about apostolic origin, every now and again, someone will show up and say, oh, well, what about this book that wasn't included in the Bible? That was a great scandal uh, at some point in church history that it wasn't included. And it, it, usually that kind of thing comes from someone saw a documentary on History Channel somewhere. But a good example of that is people will show up and say, well, what about the Gospel of Thomas? And in 1942, I think we found the Gospel of Thomas in a cave somewhere. 
And so there was kind of this thing that rose up that, oh, this should be in the Bible. He found a copy of it somewhere. And, and so some conspiracy theories rise up that, oh, well, it wasn't included for this reason or, or that reason, or there's some secret conspiracy to keep it out. Well, the point is, when we consider that book, uh, it's been dated back to 130 or 180 AD. A revel uh, revelation is recorded around 100 AD. Um, we don't have any books in the New Testament later than Revelation in terms of when they were written. And so the idea that we'd include a book that wasn't written until maybe on the late end, 180 AD, we're talking about someone writing this book who was not there with Jesus and probably was not there with the apostles. And so it's an interesting book. It collects some stories. It talks about Jesus and some clay doves. And that's all very interesting, but it's not apostolic. It was not written by the people that were there with Jesus. It was not directly informed by the people that were there with Jesus, but it comes along much later. And so it's not even a question or a discussion point at the Council of Carthage. Um, second criteria is reliable teaching, that, that the book that's to be included is reliable. That is to say that as we think about what the church teaches, what the church has been taught, what has been passed down from Jesus, what we find in other books that are accepted universally around the world as being God's scripture. Um, as we consider a particular book, we want to know how it lines up with these other teachings. And we want to find that that book is reliable, that there's nothing in there that we say, well, this disagrees with what God says over here, or this disagrees with what, you know, Paul wrote over here, that everything we find included is in agreement. And so it is reliable. Uh, the third criteria is that it is confirmed. And by confirmed, what we mean is that all the church around the world is able unanimously to agree that this is God's scripture. And so when we're considering a particular book and should it be part of our canon or not, the first thing that's considered is, is it apostolic in origin? The second thing that's considered is, is it reliable? And the third thing that's considered is, does the whole church already accept this as God's word? And those are the criteria they use in 397. And in 397, we consider our canon closed. And the 27 books of the New Testament are, are set and sealed off. This is what we are saying is God's inspired word. And the reason we say it's God's inspired word is because this is what has been handed down to the church through the generations. And so um, I would say, I hope that this conversation has given you some confidence in the process of canonization. And there are always little things that pop up where someone says, oh, well, what about this book? Or what about this meeting that occurred 700 years later? And I'm glad to try and answer those questions as best as I'm able to find answers for them. Um, but the heart of what I want to convey to you today is that we have confidence in our Bible and we have confidence in the books that were included in our Bible because the process of canonization was not deciding it was not choosing. It was not a political process. But it was a process where we acknowledge, remember, recognize, and list those books which the church has used from nearly its inception to determine what the right beliefs and practices and teachings for the body of Christ should be. God bless you, and I hope you'll join us next week for more of how we got our Bible.